Apple versus the FBI gets even more heated, Secure Socket Layer version 2 is broken, why are people still using it? And the Turing Award goes to... Hmm, all that coming up now on ThreatWire. Hello world, I'm Shannon Morse and this is ThreatWire for March 4th, 2016. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Patrons, be on the lookout for a new security episode by Darren Kitchen. It will be on the Patreon feed this week. And of course, if you want early access to extras, check out our Patreon page over at patreon.com slash threatwire. And on to the stories, the first one being a big one. First off, I would like to toss some props over to my co-host for his very informative summary of the Apple versus FBI debate story. This is an ongoing topic, so I would like to build upon what we already know. If you are unfamiliar with this, please refer to our last episode of ThreatWire. It has much importance in it. So much has happened since last week's widely debated controversy involving Apple's technology and the FBI wanting access to a now deceased suspect's iPhone, including Apple not complying with the request. Several different tech giants, including Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Sundar Pichai, of the CEO of Google, have spoken out about their support for Apple during the court battle. An amicus brief was also written in favor of Apple by many, many crucial iPhone security researchers as well as top security professionals in the field. Now, while support of other companies and persons can only get you so far in a lawsuit, Apple does have a really strong defense in this case, claiming that their unwillingness to create an alternative operating system, specifically designed to backdoor this iPhone is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Now, since Apple would have to sign this new code with their digital signature to allow it to work on an iPhone, they're saying that this would be covered under the First Amendment, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So surprisingly, code is considered a form of speech. So it would would be covered under the First Amendment, and it has been protected since the Bernstein versus U.S. Department of Justice trial in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Huh. Surprising thought. Now, this is the first of its kind when it comes to digitally signing code. Apple is also using an argument against the All Writs Act, which the government is using to try to gain access to the phone through Apple. Now, the All Writs Act, which, by the way, was passed way back in the 1700s, yeah, so it's kind of old, authorizes the United States federal courts to, quote, issue all writs necessary or appropriate in aid of their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the usages and principles of law, end quote. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALIA for short, from the 1990s is also being used by Apple as a defense because this law has written protocols about what can and cannot be requested from a private company. Nowhere in CALIA states that encryption must be broken or cracked, although it does allow the government to use electronic surveillance in telecommunications, which are very, very different indeed. And I have links to all of those different logs and regulations down in the show notes below on YouTube. YouTube. Now, the heated debate is under the scrutiny of people in the U.S. as well as worldwide because of the precedent that it creates for our future privacy. And I know you have heard that word way too many times this week, but I'm going to repeat it again precedent. It's very important, which it's starting to look more and more like reality in cases that have nothing to do with terrorism, but everything to do with breaking encryption. All current cases in court involve the All Writs Act and Apple, with one so far ruling in Apple's favor. Yeah. So Congress has started hearing arguments as of March 1st, and oral arguments are scheduled for March 22nd. This fight is nowhere near over, and it will be a huge priority for privacy advocates across the board. When it comes to our safety, our security, and our privacy, are they all one and the same, or do you consider one more important than the others? Close to 25% of the top 1 million websites on the worldwide internets are susceptible to an attack on TLS, the Transport Layer Security Protocol, nearly 11 million websites total across the tubes being vulnerable. Now this attack, it's called Drown for Decrypting RSA with Obsolete and Weakened Encryption, uses the TLS protected RSA crypto system through SSL version 2, which is Secure Socket Layer version 2, which was 
retired two decades ago and upgraded to TLS. So SSL version 2 goes to TLS, should have been retired, people are still using it. Eh. An attacker would have to use SSL version 2 to connect to the server over and over again, eventually gaining enough data on the encryption key that is used on that server. So this attack opens up a floodgate of information for this attacker. While this shouldn't happen, some TLS communications haven't been configured correctly, and this problem kind of sneaked in. So OpenSSL, for example, an implementation of TLS has been confirmed as being susceptible to the attack. So for OpenSSL users, it has since been upgraded and been fixed. You can upgrade to version 1.0.2G or 1.0.1S ASAP. And for others, you can use a firewall to kind of protect yourself and filter SSL version 2 from connecting. Now lastly, the researchers who found this vulnerability have created a form to run a check against your own server at their website, and that is linked below. Lastly for today, I wanted to congratulate the creators of the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Protocol, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, on the ACM Turing Award of 2015 for $1 billion. Back in 1976, they wrote about a protocol for crypto key exchanges called Diffie-Hellman, which was the original originating protocol for PGP, TLS, and so many more. Now, their paper was one of the major highlights of public and private key handshakes in how the encryption works, and it is currently being used to build even better cryptography to this day. So, congrats, guys. You deserve it. <laughs> now, early access to show summaries, behind-the-scenes pictures, Darren Kitchen security videos, it's all available for patrons over at patreon.com slash threatwire. Plus, when we hit our very next goal, which we are creeping closer, so help us out and share the show, we will make an RSS feed. If you are already a patron, thank you so much, and I hope you're enjoying all the behind the scenes content. Our show is independent and it is ad free because of your help, so we thank you very, very much. And of course, if you are a Hush Puppy contributor, send us pictures of your furry friends because we love seeing your pet pals, even if they aren't actually really pet pals, they're just stuffed animals. But you know what? That's okay, because stuffed animals are awesome. <laughs> Moving on, you can find all of our episodes, links to our social networks, and other ways to contribute over at threatwire.net. And with that, I am Shannon Morse. I will see you on the internet.